All right. Well, hello, everyone. I am attorney Connie Kaplan. I'm an immigration attorney here in Fort Lauderdale. We help immigrants everywhere make the United States their permanent home. And because we help immigrants, we have somebody here present with us, uh, Mr. Pat O'Day, who's an insurance broker and who helps our clients. So, Pat, you want to introduce yourself? Tell us what you do. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you very much, Connie. My name is Patrick O'Day. I deal in individual health insurance, not only for immigrants, but for everyone. Uh, I also deal in commercial uh, health insurance, life insurance, and Medicare for older folk. Um, but this is definitely a must-needed video uh, for folks, especially in light of things. And I want to say thank you very much for having me attend. Great. So we are going to start with the presentation and we have a couple of slides ready for everyone. Before we get started on that, since I'm an attorney, I have to do the legal disclaimers. So this is not a one-on-one -on -one presentation. So any questions you might have, remember there is no confidentiality that attaches. Remember there is no attorney client privilege and you will not receive any personalized advice or answers if you have any questions. Any questions that you have right now, I encourage you to put them in the chat, not in the Q&A session, solely because today it appears that I have technical difficulties with the way the Zoom updated. So uh, please leave your questions in chat and at the end of the presentation we will try to address them all. That being said, let me start sharing and hope that works. Let me know if you guys see that. Absolutely. All right, great. So like we said, we are going to talk about getting insurance. If you guys see me look that way, it's because that's where my other screen is showing. So um, we are going to talk about getting health insurance for immigrants. And the biggest question is, how can I get health insurance as an immigrant in the United States? And we are both going to address these questions as they, are, as they pertain mostly to immigration part or to insurance. And please, Pat, if you feel like you have something to add to a specific slide where it seems to be more legal and anything you'd like to add, jump in, all right? It's all I about providing will. these people with information. So the... The slides are based on some of the most common questions that we get from our clients or prospective clients as they pertain to obtaining health insurance. And I'm going to address a couple of legal issues as well. So let's get started. First question generally that comes up is, can I apply for a health insurance subsidy through the marketplace if I am a conditional residence, resident and I have already submitted my I-751 application. So like every lawyer would do, let's break that question down into pieces. So first, health insurance and the health insurance subsidy are not the same thing. The health insurance is the health insurance plan or coverage that you would get by paying a premium and receiving some sort of protection. And the subsidy is some sort of government money that you would receive in order to help you pay for that policy. Am I correct, Pat? You are absolutely correct. All right. And then the marketplace. We are going to refer to the marketplace or Affordable Care Plan, Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare. Is the same thing? Am I correct? You are absolutely correct. All right, I did my homework, good. Now, <laughs> as, to, as to the legal part on this, what's a conditional resident? A conditional resident is a lawful permanent resident who obtained his residency through marriage and the first green card is two years and now they submitted their 751 application, which is the application to remove the conditions on that application. So, for purposes of the subsidy, because that's a that is the question that was asked, any health insurance subsidy is considered public assistance if it's funded by taxpayer dollars. And the reason that is there funded by taxpayer dollars is because in Florida, where we are, it is indeed funded by taxpayer dollars. In other states, it may not be. So 
depends on where you are, and we are going to focus on Florida, but that doesn't mean it's not the same in your state. You should definitely con uh, consider speaking with an immigration attorney in your state if you are not in Florida and seek the help of an insurance broker licensed in your specific state. It may vary, it's, differences are huge between states. So first things first, a health insurance subsidy is considered public assistance. Public assistance. That being said, it is best not to accept any subsidy. Uh, Pat, when we accept a subsidy, when you are applying for an insurance plan through the marketplace, can you decline the subsidy and still get the plan? Absolutely, absolutely. You see, a subsidy is based on the entire household income and they're going to base that amount uh, based on the ages and based on the number of members within the plan. So a lot of people who um, don't want to take that risk not knowing what their income is going to be like, they may opt out to take that subsidy and then just go ahead and buy the health insurance. Okay, so there is a workaround from around that subsidy that does not affect your immigration if so you can still get the health insurance plan through the marketplace the coverage might be different but you can decline the subsidy and still have the plan correct correct great now you have to keep in mind that the public assistance is something that is of consideration for all the prospective immigrants applying for green card and even for a certain period after green card we'll go over that and you have to be mindful of the subsidies until you become a u.s citizen uh, the reason for that is let's say if your spouse has a marketplace Medicaid plan while you are while she's out of work, will that affect my green card application? So let's say I am married, I am the prospective immigrant, and my spouse is out of work. If my spouse has a marketplace plan, obviously we're thinking with subsidy or a Medicaid plan, would that affect my green card application? It really depends because you can still accept the marketplace without a subsidy. However, Medicaid is a state plan, right? And that is funded by taxpayer dollars. So because it's a taxpayers, taxpayer dollars are involved, receiving such plan does affect your uh, eligibility for permanent resident. However, USCIS, which is the immigration agency, only considers benefits like the marketplace Medicaid plans if they were received by the prospective immigrant. So if I'm prospect the prospective immigrant and it's not me who's on that Medicaid or marketplace plan, that it's not uh, counted against me. So benefits received by my family members are not counted against me as the prospective immigrant for public charge purposes. However, Officers, USCIS officers, immigration officers can use their discretion to evaluate the applicant's family members and their use of benefits to indicate other negative factors such as low income. So let me give you an example on that, which is quite common. Uh, we have had a client, she, is, um, she has two children, she is a US citizen. Uh, she has two children who are US citizens. Uh, she receives subsidized housing and she also receives uh, Medicaid for the children, not for herself. When she is sponsoring her uh, parent to come from her country and immigrate to the United States, the government is going to look at for the public charge purposes. And because the prospective immigrant is not receiving any of those plans under this specific uh, point in the public charge, it will not be counted against that, however, against the prospective immigrant. However, because the officer can use discretion, the officer will interpret the fact that our client and her children receiving Medicaid indicates low income and as such could consider that against the prospective immigrant and deny their visa. 
uh, they are considered retroactively to February, 20, February 24th, 2020. And every single one of the benefits is considered a point and you cannot have more than 12 points. It's a complicated calculation. Don't try to do it on your own. Um, for example, if you have a family that has two children and they receive for example, for February and March, so that's two months, they received Medicaid, food stamps, and subsidized housing. That is Medicaid, food stamps, subsidized housing times two months times two children. That's 12. That's already 12 points in one single month. So they're done. They cannot, uh, calc they cannot use the public charge will work against them in this case. So Let's focus on the next, I'm missing something, hold on. Oh, let's go up. All right, so there are exceptions, Medicaid benefits received if you are pregnant and up to 60 days after having uh, the baby, if you used Medicaid for emergencies or for those who are under the age of 21 when they received this benefits. So those are the only exceptions. Then the next question is, if I applied for Medicaid mm -hmm. after I become a resident, will this cause any problems for me? So yes, we discussed that. So it's not an issue for Medicaid under those three exceptions that we just went over, pregnancy and up to 60 days after birth, emergencies or by those under the age of 21. Remember applying for Medicaid though, after becoming a person, a, a permanent resident for all other reason, yes, it could affect your naturalization process if it occurred within the first five years of becoming a permanent resident. What we have seen happen is clients coming to see us and saying, okay, fine, I'll buy some sort of health insurance, I'll get my green card, and then we'll see if something happens, I will go on Medicaid. Well, that is an issue because if you go on Medicaid for the first five years after becoming a permanent resident, it will affect your naturalization process. And furthermore, if you travel outside the United States as a permanent resident for more than six months, you can be found inadmissible upon your return uh, under the public charge rule, basically for receiving benefits, risk of being placed in removal proceedings, deportation, and it will affect your naturalization. Again, this doesn't apply in case of those emergencies that are exempt. Hi, this one, this is a big one. Is the information provided when enrolling in health insurance or the marketplace used for immigration enforcement purposes? They say it doesn't, but no information provided to the marketplace will be used for immigration enforcement purposes. However, when filling out any applications to receive any of these benefits, be careful, any misrepresentation on an application is considered fraud. And that is what could potentially jeopardize your immigration status. I'm going to say this with a caveat because the government had previously said, for example, when they uh, started the DACA program, you can come out of the shadows, you can put all the information that you need on this immigration application, including when did you enter the country, who did you enter the country with, who were the relatives that you traveled with, your, where are your parents, where are your sisters, where are your brothers, and we are not going to use any of that against you. Fast forward six years, and right now that is being uh, considered. So that is something you need to uh, be careful when you are applying for your own plan, don't do it without an immigration attorney if you have um, serious questions about that. All right, and this is where we switch to paths because some of these are like so over my head. I do immigration, so I don't know much about insurance. That's why we have uh, Patrick here. So does Florida have any health insurance option that is specifically for immigrants and at a lower cost? Pat. Well, there are no specific plans designed for immigrants. Um, however, uh, you may be eligible for a marketplace or non-marketplace plan, depending on where you are in the process. Okay, you spoke thoroughly about accepting a government subsidy. That is your department and how it affects on the uh, approval side to uh, become naturalized. 
However, some plans that have certain benefits that make it very affordable. As an example, um, you could get plans at half to 60% less expensive than the marketplace. And the big question is why? Why are some plans so much less expensive than, quote, a marketplace Obamacare or Affordable Care Act plan? Quite simply, those plans are not under the regulation of the Affordable Care Act due to recent changes that has occurred with our current administration. And the other thing is the marketplace plans are pricing and rating you as if you have the worst type of illness as possible because the marketplace you know wants to be able to assess that risk if someone or anyone goes on to a marketplace plans and they get very sick so over the course of the affordable care act which started in 2012 they've had these massive rate increases to where we are today and those increases and those prices price in the risk is if somebody got very sick right away. Um, but to answer the questions, there are catastrophic plans. There are plans that have doctor visits, emergency room coverage, um, urgent care, major hospitalization, and once again, at about 60 to 50% less than the cost of health insurance. Uh, one last caveat, which may be on the next slide, but these plans that are cost less uh, than the full price of an Obamacare or Affordable Care Act plan, they do not cover major pre-existing conditions from the onset of the policy. Obviously, if something happened to you later on, yes, absolutely, you will be covered once you're approved for the plan, but they do not cover major pre-existing conditions. An example, if I was a type 1 diabetic taking injections, and I had a phone call from a prospective someone in the process of becoming um, naturalized here. And they said to me, I'm a diabetic and I would like one of those less expensive plans. I would tell them you do not qualify and possibly your application could go through, but God forbid something was to happen to you. They would associate the illness or whatever's wrong with you to that pre-existing condition, which was erroneously filled out on the application, and they would deny all claims, um, and that's not a very good thing. What? How do you de uh, how do you describe a catastrophic plan? What would that? Okay. Plan be? <clears throat> Absolutely. Some folks don't mind exposure in cost. So, for example, who has five hundred thousand dollars to in the United States? That is to uh, pay for a quadruple bypass, that is changing the valves of the heart. No one, or at least not too many people that I know. So a catastrophic plan is something that will give someone $1 million, $2 million worth of coverage, high deductible, it could be $10,000, $25,000 deductible, and a coinsurance cost share, maybe another 5,000 to 10,000 in there, but, they have access to hospitals, they have access to doctors, God forbid something catastrophic happens. Again, cancer, heart attack, stroke, um, slip and falls, emergency room coverages and things of that nature. That is more catastrophic. For illustration purposes and cons not considering immigrant, not immigrant, a typical plan in the marketplace or not marketplace for say a th healthy 30 year old, premium would be about what? A healthy 30-year-old, um, there are a little bit more factors that are involved. Sure. And in, in this country, it is called networks. You can have very, very, very small networks of doctors, okay? These plans you will find very inexpensive because the smaller network means that the network is paying the doctors less money than as if you had a very wide network of doctors and why do the doctors want to participate in that network? Because they get paid more. Similarly with private hospitals and things of that nature. So with that being said, you could go onto the marketplace for a 30 year old person and you can get a very narrow network, reasonable deductible of let's say 5,000 to 8,000 and it would cost you anywhere from 275 to 325. Now, 
What if you had the money? What if you wanted a very large network of doctors and premium care, nothing but the best doctors that are out there? You could pay for that same 30-year-old seven to 800 for that same plan with a wide network. Same deductible? And the same deductible, 5,000, 3,000, 8,000. It, it, it pretty much varies. There are many plans on there, but again, it's that network that will dictate um, the price. Some people like narrow networks because they don't go to the doctor that much. I'll go see anybody. And some folks want the best of the best. And that's where you, you have to, and I regulate that and I offer different plans based on their needs. Can you talk about Florida health insurance supplemental plans? Absolutely. So there are supplemental plans that give coverages for only cancer, heart attack, stroke, critical illness, or an accident. Um, so basically, let's, uh, let's have an example. A person is perfectly healthy. I never get sick. I just want something that if I ended up in the hospital overnight, for something either, uh, you know, a major accident or, or, or a major infection or something of that nature that's going to at least relieve some of the pain of the bill. Because whether um, folks on this video don't know, unfortunately, in the United States, a one day hospital stay, 24 hours, could literally cost you $27,000. Okay. Mm -hmm. So these supplemental plans they will give you cash benefit of 20,000, 30,000, 50,000, accident benefit of 10,000. So how does that help? So uh, you're, you're a fairly healthy person and you, know, you, you don't want all the bells and whistles. You're 25 to 30 years old. You're, you, everything is going well. You, you just need to get something to get by temporarily until this is done and you really want to get good health insurance. Well, you get yourself a $10,000 accident plan you get yourself a $50,000 critical illness or hospital plan. It's not going to cover everything, but at least it will reduce some of the burden. God forbid something was to happen. All right, great. I think I lost a share, so I'm going to share it again. Sorry about yes. that. Yes. <laughs> All right. We were in the same place. Good job. All right. Awesome. Can I get uh, any uh, health insurance coverage before I receive my social security number? Yes, and those are back to um, either catastrophic plans or a little bit more robust plans. These plans are also known as short term, and there's also plans called indemnity. Okay, so a little difference between the two. Um, you have your doctor visits, you have your hospitalization and things of that nature. And by the way, I, since the law has been changed, releasing the mandate, the mandate was a penalty for not having Obamacare. Uh, these plans have gone through the roof because, why? Because it's less expensive and there's a lot of healthy folks out there who were forced to pay the Obamacare. But with all that being said, um, you can get a health insurance plan that's going to cover all your needs away from Obamacare as long as you do not have a pre-existing condition and as long as you're not looking to have maternity covered, okay? These non-Obamacare options do not cover maternity. So what other plans cover maternity and pre-existing? Company, employer, group plans. Okay. So if you are not covered by your employer and or your spouse's employer, it cannot happen. You can still get some sort of insurance without having a social security card, but the options are somewhat limited. Correct. Absolutely. But we definitely can protect um, the individual and the individual's family. As an example, I myself have a non-Obamacare option. And as an example, if I went on to Obamacare with a great network right now at my age of going to be 59, shh, um, to uh, my wife is 58, um, my daughter is 25, my son is 23. If I was to go on to the Obamacare website with no government subsidy, I could pay as much as, I say as much as because of a wide network, sure. I could pay as much as $2,800, okay? Now, there are narrow network plans 
where I could pay as much as seventeen to eighteen hundred dollars for my family of four. But the non-Obamacare options, which are the same duration, 12 months, 24 months, 36 months, I pay $1,100 a month with better network and better coverages in some cases. Wow. Big differences. Yes. So if a spouse doesn't have health insurance through their work, which plan is recommended for families of at least two? And I know you addressed it a little bit, but let's go over those. Well, you can definitely apply for a, a, a non-ACA plan, which is what I discussed. These are the half the price of, of the Obamacare with no subsidy. Major pre-existings are not covered, nor is maternity. Um, but however, you could apply through the marketplace um for those two people but remember it depends on the household income so even though one family member is not on the plan it's based on the household's income including that person so how does the federal government find out well one of the requirements to getting a, a marketplace government subsidy if someone was to consider this is to file your taxes at the end of the year they match what you put on your application for the subsidy to exactly what you said on your joint tax return at the end of the year, and they put it together. And if there's any differenti uh, differential, they say, okay, you told us you made 30,000, but in actuality, you made 50,000. We gave you too much money. We want it back. Oh, wow. And the, al and the alternative is if you claim that you made 40000 but in actuality, you only made 25000 the federal government will tell you, you overpaid for your insurance, you should have gotten more, we're going to give you money back towards the health insurance that you paid for this past year, okay? But back to your point, Connie, um, if it is best to avoid that government subsidy um, based on all the repercussions yeah. that it could possibly have, then I completely agree. Um, either only go with an Obamacare plan if you have to based on your health, or if you can afford it, by all means. Um, and, you know, preferably go with a non-Obamacare option until you've come through that, quote, grace period yeah. where taking a government assistance um, would be uh, worth your while. Got it. All right. So those people who have had permanent residency for at least five years, they can really take the subsidy or do whatever they want. Those before the five year period or prospective immigrants, they need to be very careful and not take any subsidy. So once employed, will the spouse have to report the change in income for the family's insurance plan? Absolutely. So I, I kind of touched on that in the, in the prior slide. Yeah. Um, your income is definitely regulated and has to be um, uh, given to uh, the IRS when you file your tax returns. And as I said, if your income is higher than what you stated, you have to pay it back. And if it is lower, then you may get a return. Now, uh, I'm not going to talk about people working um, off the books. Um, no. that, you know, that is, you know, basically not the logistical or the correct way that things are being calculated. These are actual employees with salary that people, folks pay taxes on. Um, but um, you must file a joint tax return. That uh, I really do stress that because sometimes you can file individual, uh, uh, married filing individual. Yeah. That does not work for the health insurance marketplace upon getting a subsidy. You must file jointly. Oh, interesting. Interesting because we, uh, most of our clients actually do not file jointly. They file uh, married filing separately at the mm. end of the year. Uh, again, very few actually go through the marketplace, so it might not matter. Uh, but what about dependents listed on each other's tax returns or appearing at the same address regardless of how they filed? How does the uh, sure. marketplace consider that? Okay, very simple. If a person is declared a dependent on their joint tax return, 
then their income is included in the household income. Um, if a dependent is on their own, they file their own taxes, then they are not part of that tax return and they're going to use their Obamacare subsidies and their approvals based on their individual income. Oh, interesting. Great. See, I'm learning from you all the time. Mm -hmm. So if we have somebody here who's here on a non-immigrant visa, travel, work visa, what kind of protection can they get in case of a medical emergency? Absolutely, and we touched on that before. You can either get a catastrophic plan based on your health, how often you go to the doctors. These are the questions that I ask. I ask folks specific questions on their health, and then I tell them, how often do you use your insurance? And then I ask them, go back five years. What has happened to you in the past five years? Mm -hmm. You know, How many times in those five years has something really major happened to you? How is your health? What is your family history like? Is there a family history of major, maybe a lot of cancer or, or things of that nature? And this is all based on age. So I will basically regulate um, these particular options away from Obamacare um, on, on their needs. Now, um, I will present a price to folks and, 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 and a health insurance plan for them. And if they tell me, you know, Patrick, um, I wasn't thinking about spending that much money. I know it's cheaper than Obamacare, but it's all about a budget. Then I will recommend a more catastrophic plan. There's an old saying in my business, something is better than nothing. Okay. Even if you had a $10,000 deductible and a million dollars worth of coverage, you know, you're gaining the access to a facility because you have health insurance. You're gaining the access to a doctor because you have health insurance, even though your deductible may be quite high. They are now not accepting patients if they do not have health insurance coverage. There are some hospitals that literally you could have a, a pretty lousy health insurance plan and I'll, I'll use, um, I never said it, Mount Sinai as an example. <laughs> you could go there and your insurance is not within network with Mount Sinai. And after they've repaired you due to an emergency or God forbid, heart attack, cancer, stroke, or whatever might happen, then they say to you, I'm sorry, we don't take your insurance. Um, here is your bill. Okay, so... You have to make sure that the insurance that you get, and these options are very widely accepted, just because they're half the price does not mean that they're not accepted. They are great, widely accepted plans. It's just that you could stretch them beyond Obamacare to your exposure limit, meaning $5,000, $10,000, $15,000, $25,000 deductible. But in the scheme of things, and I'll end with this, in the scheme of things, if you had a $500,000 bill, and you're accepted and you're taken care of and your responsibility is 25,000, you could definitely take care of that $25,000 over the course of a period of time and yourself or your loved one is taken care of as opposed to going with nothing and the, the hospitals, facilities and, and, and treatment centers basically say there's nothing we can do. You have no health insurance unless you have $50,000 to get started. So before we go on with the rest of the slides, I think it's important to mention, since we are talking about generally immigrants, um, I want to mention people coming from most other countries are non-initiated at all as to what health insurance is. And they are shocked, actually, the first time that they have to go see a physician or they have to seek medical care because when, they have, when they're handed the bill. And they don't understand the concept of paying for healthcare in most of the countries or other countries uh, outside the United States is paid by the government or it's something so transparent that the thought never even occurred to them. And uh, they definitely don't understand the concept of having health insurance. How do you explain it to them? Um, basically what I do is, um, if they're in this country and in the process of becoming um, legalized for whatever, whatever uh, that might be, whether a permanent resident, um, yeah. whatever it might be, um, is the way I explain it to them is simply like car insurance. In order to keep your car on the road, 
um, you have to have car insurance. Well, what if I don't get car insurance? I'm not going to buy car insurance. Well, if you can't buy car insurance, then they're not going to register your car. And if you can't register your car, then you're going to be driving around with an illegal car. And if a policeman pulls you over, you could be arrested. So you're forced to buy that insurance. Well, it's almost on the same with the health insurance side, more um, of a humanitarian issue. So if you don't have health insurance, you know, you can't have yourself or your loved one taken care of. And this is very important. Uh, a little story. I was born and raised in New York City, upstate New York and also in New York. And in New York City, uh, water is free. So mm -hmm. you base and it's actually the best water in the it United is. States. You know what I mean? So, um, you know, turn on the tap water, whatever apartment you rent, wherever you buy, whatever, water is free. I came down to Florida about in 1993 and they said, okay, you got to set up your, your, your water and your sewer. And I was like, my water and my sewer, but that's free. No, it's not free here in Florida. So that is the simplified version of, you know, in order for me to have drinking water, I have to pay for it. And same one. Great. So in terms of insurance basics, and do correct me if I'm wrong, premium is the amount somebody pays out of pocket on a monthly basis to buy the insurance. So that's the price you pay to get the product, right? Absolutely then correct then deductible is the money that you have to pay out of pocket before the insurance pays their first dollar. Well, yes and no. I'll correct you a little bit. Yes. For, I call them upfronts, the upfronts, um, doctor visits, wellness visits, uh, emergency room care. These are called copays. So this is an amount that you don't have to reach your deductible that is a set dollar amount. So for example, if you went to a physician, you had a bad cold, he will have you come in and say, okay, you have good insurance and here is your copay for this visit, $30. And it will always be $30 for every single cold or a family member has, that's your set copay. Assuming um, you go in network, correct? Correct, outside of network, these copays could double or no coverage at all, and you have to pay the full price of what the doctor is asking. And it could be as much as $125 to $175, whatever the doctor deems um, standard and usual within their area. And that's why it's important to have the health insurance coverage and know the bigger the network, the more coverage you get. The more coverage you get and the more quality of doctors is sure. very important. Too. Great. Good. So we got the insurance basics out. Everybody should know what the deductible, coinsurance, copay, and so on is. Let's discuss differences in uh, plans. For example, uh, HMO, POS, PPO, indemnity, because people will get so lost. In basic terms, how would you describe them? Okay. Well, indemnity, it just goes back to the simple financial term of what indemnity means. And indemnity is a lump sum. So uh, as an example with an indemnity plan, if you went to a doctor, after your discount for being in that work, and uh, we can talk about that in another time because you get a percentage off by staying in network, but they'll apply $50 towards your visit. So you may owe them another $50. Um, as far as HMOs, and HMO stands for Health Maintenance Organization. And these are more narrow networks, doctor, doctors working for less money from a network. Um, you'll find a lot of doctors that are starting off. You'll find a lot of doctors that have basically a good, um, what's the right word, a way of bringing their customers in and taking care of them very quickly, a large operation, they will accept the HMOs because although the network pays less, they're seeing more people and they're making it up in volume, believe it or not. When you get to a POS, now you're opening up um, your uh, network because point of sale or POS, those networks pay more. And PPO, which is preferred pro uh, provider organization, you are basically really opening up 
your network ability and the way that they pay the doctors, the hospitals, um, diagnostic centers, and things of that nature. So to simply, uh, to make it a little bit more simple, what should I get? An HMO or should I get a PPO? Whatever you can afford. Exactly, whatever your preference is. I will make one final statement on the non-Obamacare options. There are no HMOs, it's only PPOs. Okay, great. But whatever it is, pick one and get some sort of insurance, right? Right, and, and that's why it's so important to talk to uh, an agent, a broker, yeah. okay? And the other thing I would recommend for folks, you know, if they don't talk to me and they, and they know someone or someone has a friend of a friend who does health insurance, if you're speaking to an agent that only represent one company and they are captured by one company, that means they're only going to put you into that one company's plan and they're going to uh, avoid offering you and showing you anything else out there that may be a better fit. You want to speak to someone who represents all carriers and based on the questions and what I call the pre-qual or pre-qualification, I make sure that the plan that they get from an affordability perspective and their protection will work best for them. Great. I agree with you. I think everybody should try to get some sort of insurance, no matter how little, it's still better than nothing. So like you said. So the mm -hmm. next question is, if my family is all here and we have different statuses, could be citizen, lawful permanent resident, whatever it is, no status, do I have one option that could insure everybody? Yes, that would definitely be the non-Obamacare options. Um, and um, they're also called short term. They're also called indemnity. And we just talked about that. Yeah. Uh, the indemnity is a little bit more of a high risky plan, but more affordable. But it will give you something, some coverage based on your on your budget. But I would always target short term first, because, again, even though it's term short term, it does not mean it's not as long as an Obamacare plan. It does not mean it's, as, it's not as long as an employer plan. Um, basically, you can get it for three months if you think something good is going to happen regarding your application, um, or you could get it for as long as 12 months and renew it. So the entire family could be on a short-term plan. Again, entertaining $1 million, $2 million worth of coverage, doctor visits with a copay, emergency room, urgent care coverage, prescription drug coverage, and any way you can sort that through based on your needs, based on your budget. So to clarify the term indemnity, I remember a long time ago, and I'm not gonna date myself like you did, but a long time ago <laughs> in New York, I had, I remember it was Blue Cross Blue Shield and it was an indemnity plan. Back then an indemnity plan was something with a $200 deductible and they would pay 80% and you'd be responsible for the 20%. The current indemnity plans are not that, correct? Correct. So let me give an example of um, an indemnity plan. Because I miss uh, those plans. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, you got to remember that 20% you're talking about was full exposure. Yeah. You know what I mean? So if you yeah. had a $500,000 bill, you had a $200 deductible, but you're on the hook. And For depending on what their limit, it depends on what their limit could be. Their, yeah. could, their limit could be only 50000 So uh, case in point, uh, National General, uh, a very, a very, very good company. And they have an indemnity plan where you have a choice. You can do $2,000 a day in the hospital, $3,000, $4,000, even up to $5,000 a day in the hospital. And some of these plans are unlimited days. Some of these day, uh, plans are up to 30 days. Okay. The plan also comes with doctor visits, two doctor visits with a $75 indemnity, meaning after your in-network discount, because you stayed within the network, they're going to give $75 towards that visit. Um, and um, let's compare this, which would be very good. Uh, you also have urgent care and allotment for that. Um, you also have surgical $10,000 towards the surgery and so on and so forth. So there's a whole, a whole list of columns of how much they're going to pay towards and no more. Okay, so let's take a look at the difference in pricing as compared from an Obamacare plan to an indemnity plan. Remember I said before, a 30-year-old 
could cost are right between two hundred and seventy five to three hundred and fifty dollars um, you know for a, a, a pretty decent plan with a decent network you could get a two thousand dollar indemnity uh, hospital stay two thousand a day uh, indemnity plan um, with those few benefits underneath it for about a hundred and seventy eight dollars okay so um, I assess the risk of, or an agent, a good agent, will assess the risk of the individual based on their budget and realistic um, ideology. One of my first questions when I speak to somebody is, what, what is in your budget for health insurance? Am I doing that to hit a number? No, no. We have to understand their realism as far as the cost of health insurance in this country as much as it does think that you have to buy health insurance in this country, but more being more realistic. And I set those realisms, I set those expectations on based on your budget, here is what you can get. My recommendation is if you can go a little bit further and get this. And then sometimes I have people, family of four, they say, and um, they are um, in the process and they are buying businesses and things of that nature and they're very wealthy and they say you know whatever it costs just give me your best plan away from obamacare and then i do that as well based on their health great is there a difference in health insurance options for residents and citizens uh well um when, when you say citizens i i'm i'm imagining you you mean basically people that are here yes. legally. yes and the difference is very simple. Non-Obamacare are options versus Obamacare, okay? So uh, case in point, let's say um, back to uh, heart problems. If someone um, is a citizen and there's a, they do newly citizens and newly permanent residents, and there is a history of heart problems or a possible heart attack um, in the past, I am not putting them with a non-Obamacare option. Now what I can do, is put that one individual with an Obamacare and the rest of the family on a non-Obamacare and that'll cut down the major costs from keeping the entire family on there. But just remember, if down the road you're looking for a government subsidy, it's based on the entire household income. So that person who's getting the Obamacare may not qualify for a government subsidy because only one person is on the plan based on for yeah. people in, or, or the household income, I should say. Interesting. Well, you have so much to navigate. I don't need to know all that. Yeah. So are there options for short-term coverage? And I know we covered that quite a bit, but I want you yes, to talk did. to me about the companies and networks that you offer. Sure. Um, my favorite uh, is probably United Healthcare. They are the uh, most uh, empathetic, um, well-balanced and, um, for lack of better words, well-oiled machines of insurance company that I've ever seen. They're great with their customer service. Uh, they're great with their agents. They're very flexible in what I can do for customers and things like that. Um, uh, the Aetna PPO is through National General because remember, regardless of the name of the company, it's yep. all about the network that they're using. So the Aetna PPO is through a company by the name of National General. They've been around for many, many years. They deal in many different insurances from homeowner's insurance to, to car insurance and things of that nature. Um, then we have Cigna, which is through Pivot Health, and they have many, many different options, um, but Cigna is a very, very good PPO. And again, what does PPO stand for? Very wide network. Um, remember with these plans, major pre-existing conditions are not covered, however, I'm gonna throw one last thing in there. Let's say you got a 36 month plan, meaning you're signing up for a price of a 36 month plan, but you have a minor pre-existing condition. For example, um, I have a rotator cup issue in my shoulder, which means I heard it, I was playing ball, and I have been told that I'm probably gonna need surgery sometime down the road. Okay, it's not major, it's minor, but it's surgery. Now, if I signed up for a non-Obamacare option, they're going to be able to see in my records if I tried to get this repaired like it was new. They're going to be able to do a medical background check yeah. and see that I went to the doctor. Now, 
after one year, there are clauses in 20, uh, 12 to four month plans and 36 month plan that says, as long as you stay with this plan for 12 months, we will cover it year two and okay. year three. Good. So just don't get sick the first year. <laughs> well, no, the first year is fine for anything new, for right. anything not just pre but not pre existing exactly. conditions. Exactly. Great. So I hope this was informative for folks. If they have any questions, now would be the time uh, to ask. But um, if there are any questions, please post them in the chat and we'll be more than happy to answer them. Other than that, I think we covered great ground. And here's the bottom line. If you can afford any insurance, get any insurance. Any insurance is better than no insurance. There are options, even if you don't have a social security number, there are options of that vary on price, pre-existing conditions, non-pre-existing conditions, what you need, when you need, family size, and all that. And the way to figure that one out is by calling the insurance broker, right, Pat? That is absolutely correct. Great. And if you are concerned about subsidies, Medicaid, anything like that, then uh, please let us know. And... Uh, then we can help you with the insurance part of that. So we got some questions in the Q&A. Do I have to get dental and vision insurance separately? No, you don't. Um, and here is my comment because this question comes up a lot with my customers. Um, why do I need dental, uh, we'll use dental. Why do I need dental insurance? Um, you know, I might as well just pay out of pocket. Well, here's the thing about dental and vision. They are not regulated by HIPAA law. And that means that a dentist can charge you whatever he wants to, whether you know the charges or not. When you have a dental plan, it keeps them structured that they have to maintain a pricing within the scale of the actual carrier. So there is a list of what they can charge. So it almost keeps them honest because it is an unregulated type of insurance, um, dental and vision. So when you have dental insurance and health insurance, they go by a schedule and then based on the terms of, of the actual plan of what they will cover. But you do not have to have dental and vision to answer the question. Some folks make arrangements with dentists. They're very kind and they're very nice. And on the other hand, there are some dentists out there that if you don't know what the real prices are, they could really take you uh, to the cleaners, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> Is there a penalty if I don't have health insurance? Well, the penalty uh, was removed um, back just before 2019. Uh, that was part of the tax reform of the United States by our current administration, where it was known as, um, forgive me, uh, the mandate. Mm -hmm. The mandate stated that if you do not have an Obamacare plan, based on the number of people in your household, you must pay a penalty at the end of the year. Uh, current administration uh, basically fought tooth and nail to get that removed, they could not. So within the tax bill reform, they had that removed. So no, there is no long, longer a tax penalty, um, but there could be a penalty as far as the quality of your care if you don't have any health insurance. Got it. Mm -hmm. Great. Those were all the questions that we had from uh, the attendees. And since we structured the PowerPoint slide based on prior questions and plenty that have been coming uh, from those who have registered, I think we have addressed them all. If they have any questions whatsoever, they can reach our office, my office, your office, and we'll be happy to help them out. Right. Um, and if you would like me to, uh, I'll ask your permission. Do you want me to give my uh, email address and phone number Please. on this presentation? Please. Um, just, my, you can just type it on the chat or yes, you can just course. say it verbally so it's recorded anyway. Okay, I'll do that. Uh, once again, my name is Patrick O'Day and I represent all health insurance carriers, whether it be individual, commercial, for immigration reasons and for people who are losing their jobs or self-employed. My phone number is 954-608-9622. And my email is patrickoday at bellsouth.net. And I will spell that P-A-T-R-I-C-K-O-D-E-A at 
bellsouth.net. And I, once again, Connie, I want to thank you for letting me be part of this presentation. I actually learned a few things today, too. <laughs> well, great. I learned from you, so it's always a win-win. <laughs> so a pleasure to have you here, Pat. Uh, again, I'm immigration attorney Connie Kaplan. We help immigrants everywhere make the United States their permanent home. We do help you navigate all these public charge issues and those subsidies, but we make sure you get insured if you absolutely need it. And give us a call for any questions that you might have, 954-357-0957. Talk to you guys later. A pleasure having you all. Take care, everybody. Bye.